to be with us, but also I'm just thrilled as always to those who came out tonight in the house, so we welcome you. So are we ready for the word of the Lord? Yes. Amen. We've been talking these last few weeks, uh, really since the beginning of the year, we've been talking about what the word of the year was and what is God saying for this year. And so Patrick did a phenomenal job last Wednesday. That was a great addition and just having us think and prepare for what God is saying. So I'm going to finish up this last Wednesday of the month. I'm going to wrap it all up together and talk about when we say this is a year of open doors or God is opening doors and he's giving us vision to perceive and to see. One of the things I didn't touch on was what doors are, is he opening? There are certain doors in Scripture that God talks about that if you prepare yourself, you can recognize it. I believe for most of us, divine opportunity comes, but we often miss it because we don't recognize what God is doing. Because when God opens a door, it looks very different than when people open a door. See, when people open a door, they're trying to get favor from you or they're trying to help you step into the life you want or you, they think you want. But when God opens a door, it may look completely different than what you prepared for yourself. It may look the opposite of what you think you need for your future. But a door from God sets you up for destiny. See, a door from people sets you up to live. But God opens up destiny. Destiny is bigger than the life you imagine for yourself. Destiny is when God says, I see something in you so much bigger, so much greater than what you can imagine for yourself that I'm going to open a door you don't even know you need so I can take you on a journey you never imagined for yourself so I can give you a future you thought was impossible so I can let you conquer mountains you thought were insurmountable so that you can finally recognize you were never who they said you were. You were always what God imagined. That's destiny. Destiny is when God says your whole life could not stop what you're going to be, nor could it prepare you for who you're going to be. God prepares you for destiny. So we're going to talk about a little bit of that, but I want to start out, just look someone. If you're not sitting next to somebody, then just turn where you can face somebody. I want you to say, God has something for me. <laughs> bigger than I know. You see, that's really what faith is about. Faith is agreeing that what God has for you is bigger than you can imagine. That's what healing is, that God knows how to put your body back together better than you can. Peace is God knows how to settle you and right where you are give you contentment. Joy is God knows how to take you through any situation without you losing what you think is important. So God has something for you that's greater than you can imagine. And the key is you have to agree with God. Now, every time you agree with God, faith is taking you to the next level. So every time you agree with God, God is taking you further than you can dream just agreeing with God. So the battle is, as I've, I've been saying so much lately, every battle you face is going to be a battle for agreement. Can you agree with God? The stuff that's fighting you is trying to get you to disagree with the word of God. The people around you are trying to get you to question the word of God. And your mind will tell you, you can't trust what you cannot see. So faith is to believe that the invisible has power over the visible. That right there is what changed my whole life. When I began to recognize that the invisible has power over the visible. You cannot see God. You cannot see most of the times, unless God opens your eyes, you're not going to see the angelic moving around you. You're not going to see when there's a demon at work. You're going to know it by the word. So you have to trust that what the word says has more power than what your eyes tell you. And as you begin to understand that his word is greater than your vision, his truth is greater than your past, his word is greater than your experience, it changes the world around you. And suddenly the invisible begins to become visible. That's what faith is. For we know that everything that is made is created by that which we cannot see. So the Bible declares in Hebrews chapter 11, over and over again, when you read Hebrews 11, it's not just a story of those who were great in faith. 
It's an invitation to join a club. God is inviting you by writing Hebrews 11 when he says, and by faith, Abraham did not stagger at the promises of God, but he believed God and God counted it to him as right. By faith, Joseph, who went into bondage, came out again, delivering God's people. By faith, Isaac, in that same year, reaped a hundredfold. By faith, so over and over, Noah, for the saving of his household, believed God, and God delivered his whole family. By faith, Gideon brought a nation into victory. By faith, David conquered Goliath. By, over and over, it's an invitation to you to join a group of people that history records as being people of faith. It's God's photo memory book. You ever had a photo album in your family where, you know, when you want to see what your grandparents looked like when they were young or your parents and you open up the photo album? We don't take Polaroids anymore. Now everything's on our phones. But back then you would take pictures and they'd put in a photo album and you'd look at it. And you would look and go, wow, I can't believe you ever looked that young, mom. <laughs> At which point I suggest you duck. <laughs> you look and say, I didn't know this is what grandpa did when he was young. See, photos take you back to a moment in time. But it's not just a revelation of time, it's a revelation of love. Someone loved them enough at that moment to capture that time. Hebrews chapter 11 is God telling you that he took a snapshot of somebody in their time because it made heaven look. Faith gets God's attention. When you walk by faith, God says, I need you to understand that your sacrifice, your faith, your tears were not ignored. What you did by trusting God was so important that God took a snapshot and called it faith. That's why the Bible says that your tears never go unnoticed, that God catches your tears and he holds them in heaven. It says every prayer you prayed when you prayed in faith went up as incense before him and that your worship still circles the throne. There is not a song you've ever sung that is not still floating around the throne and giving God joy. There is not a prayer you ever prayed that he ignored. The Bible says he collects them. So when you walk by faith, you have not only captured heaven's attention, God marks it in time. And God says, I will remember forever that act of faith. Oh, though nobody else saw what you did, though you don't think anybody's paying attention, God says, I remember. And I promise as long as time remains, not just your life, as long as time remains. God is talking about your faith. Whew. Do you know how deep that is? You know how powerful that is? Do you know there are days when you might want to give up that that's what makes me keep going forward? Not that people see, but when I'm sitting by myself thinking about the next thing or going forward, I meditate on the fact God Seize my faith. So I'm not going forward because somebody sees me. I'm going forward because I know he's watching. And every time I step out in faith, he says, ah, oh, that's my son. That's my son. I'm with him. This is how we operate when we understand that this is a year where God is opening doors that we may not have seen before. But how do you operate in a season when God is doing what you've never seen? By faith. Because when God does something new, it doesn't feel normal. It will always feel unusual. It will feel like it doesn't fit. It will feel like, can I really do this? It will feel like you're missing God because everything you've become comfortable in is now the old you. So when God begins to call you into your next season, it always feels like it's not for you. Is this making sense? Okay. Because moving in the spirit is, like not, is not like moving in the natural. You know, in the natural, if you're going to advance, you advance on the same job or doing the same thing and you just move to a different location or a different place that hires you, but you're pretty much doing what you've always done. So all you're doing is you're working with other people but doing the same thing. Or you advance so you're in the same system. 
See, in the kingdom, it's not so. In the kingdom, it may be that you're around the same people, but God may suddenly shift which one of your gifts he wants to use. So now it doesn't feel comfortable because you're used to teaching, but now he's telling you, don't teach so much, prophesy. Or he says, don't prophesy, just lay hands on people. Or suddenly God tells you, this is a season for you to be silent. Well, it doesn't feel normal because you're used to sharing your testimony and being around people. But suddenly God says, I want to take you somewhere different. So sit with me alone. And it doesn't make sense because that's not how you've normally operated. Because in the spirit, God has to take you somewhere different than you've been so he can show you something greater than you've known. So it always feels uncomfortable because your natural mind will say this doesn't make sense because God doesn't work like a man. He is God. And we have to stop trying to make God be just like us. He's called us to be like him. So we keep missing God because we keep trying to deflate his godness. So we can make him just be human so we can understand him with the natural mind instead of recognize that God is God and you have to see him through the word. If you don't see him through the word, you'll miss him. Is this making sense? Okay. So in this season, let's talk about this. Go to Ephesians 4, 16. I'm going to talk about the second part of the prophetic word and then how it works as we step through the door. We've read this before, but I haven't gone through it. So let's go to verse 12. Da, 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 da. Verse 11. Ephesians 4, 11. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. For what purpose? Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children, say children, children. tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Okay. So we're going to stop there just for a moment. When we begin to understand, when you're stepping into another season, God has given us wisdom, teachers, those who he has sent into the body of Christ. Now, every season, you've got to have, whether it's a teacher or a mentor, you need a teacher or a mentor. It doesn't mean that somebody else is trying to control where you're going. It means somebody has seen or heard where God is taking you. And you need to be around someone who can help you find the road sign so you get off at the right turn. So the Bible says God has given us teachers. He's given us five-fold ministry, and their job, their job is not to be spectacular. Their job is not to give you great services where everybody goes, wow, that was the best service I've ever been in. An apostle's job is not to run around and just knock everybody out on the floor. A prophet's job is not just to give everybody a prophetic word. A pastor's job is not to make everybody feel comfortable every week. A teacher's job is not to give you something that you can just write down in a book. And an evangelist's job is not just to run out into the street. Their main job, according to Scripture, is to help us grow up. According to Scripture, the Bible says, I am going to help you, Ephesians 4. And he gave gifts, the fivefold ministry. For what purpose? For the perfecting of the saints. What does that mean? That means that everywhere that we are immature, that word perfecting means maturity. Everywhere we are immature, ministry is supposed to help mature us. Now, we've lost maturity. This is why we miss open doors, because immaturity disqualifies you from leadership. So every time God has a moment ready where he's ready to promote you in the spirit, open a new door, give you the next level he's spoken to you, immaturity robs you of progress. You may have the gift to go through the door, but not the maturity to stay. Don't ever be in the position where God is ready to open a door for you, but your immaturity gets you kicked out of the room. Whew. 
That's just heavy right there. We can stop right there. We can just say good night and all go to Chick-fil-A. <laughs> See, because what many of us don't realize is God says, the Bible says the gift makes room for you. Okay. So your gift is making room. So would you do that with me? Because, you know, I just, there you go. Just, okay, just like that. Now, don't hit nobody beside you. Now, what happens is the gift that's in you, as you begin to let it out, it creates space around you. What does that space do? That space is what you would call your area of dominion. So the gift God has given you, as you begin to use your gift, you're taking dominion. You begin to own that area. Any gift that God gives you, if you give it back to God and you begin to work it with excellence, you're taking territory. So your gift being used for God creates space where you're ruling and reigning. So if you don't work your gift, you can never take dominion in the territory. See, taking dominion, uh, I don't want to try to get onto a second thing to teach, but let me run down this rabbit trail. When the Bible says in the beginning, when God made man, he gave man dominion. In the kingdom of God, you have dominion. But dominion doesn't mean that everything is supposed to listen to you just because you're born again. It doesn't mean that you can just talk and tell people what you want them to do. It doesn't mean that you can just scream at the devil and he has to obey. What it means is when God made man, he put his nature inside of man. So the creative nature of God sits inside of you. So God had dominion. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the waters. Now it says the Spirit of God sat over the waters. So the way God took dominion in the beginning was he separated order from chaos by his Spirit bringing structure. So the same way that God took dominion, he creates man and he says, now you from the garden have dominion. Bring order by doing what? Multiply. Build family. As you're working what I've given you to work with, you will increase in number and power. So your dominion is equal to how you replicate what I give you. So for many of us, what we don't realize is the reason we don't have dominion in greater measure is because you won't work with what he gave you. God gave you an idea. He gave you a song to write. He gave you someone to minister to. He told you to take one person out for coffee or talk to them. The Lord told you that you have a gift for teaching, to share something. Now, how you work that gift with one person, you are operating in that gift. That gift, as it pours into another, is going to establish the excellence of how you move, the strength of what you carry, and it's going to create in their mind and in people watching you a respect that opens up greater doors. Then if you truly begin to strengthen the gift by study, repetition, working with others, that gift now makes room for you. So you go from one student to five students. You go from one contract to three contracts. You go from five employees to 50 employees. So you now have a greater measure of dominion. You go from one song you wrote to 10 songs you've written. You go from one business deal to eight business deals. So your dominion is increasing as you operate in the gift God gave you. But if you never operate in your gift, you'll never have dominion. You can pray for it. You can shout for it. You can have hands laid on you. Dominion does not come because you ask for it. It comes because you use what he gave you. So for most of us, the reason we haven't seen God increase the level of our dominion is because we keep saying, but I'm waiting on God. And God says, waiting on me to do what? I mean, what are you waiting for? The trumpet to sound, three angels to show up, somebody to put their hand on your head, more oil poured on top of your head. What are we waiting for? So what's happened to us is because we don't understand that what good teachers are supposed to do is mature us, equip us, and send us, then we have been conditioned by religion to gather sit and wait. 
So we have no dominion in cities. We take no territory in nations. We're not reproducing in the next generation because we've been conditioned by religion to gather, sit, and wait instead of go, reproduce, and take territory. So what Jesus told them to do is the opposite of what most of us are doing. Jesus said, go into all the world. What was he doing? He was replaying, he was stating again what his father told Adam in the garden. So in the garden, the Lord said, go take the earth. And Jesus, after he rose from the dead, after he left the garden of Gethsemane, so he goes back to the garden. The last Adam visits the garden, just like the first Adam lost the garden. And the first Adam who listened to the serpent lost everything. The last Adam listened to the father and got everything back. So he's giving us permission to have dominion. But he's waiting for us to do what? Use what I gave you. So until we use what he gave us, we will never have full dominion. So how do we move forward? You first got to believe that what he gave you is enough for you to take territory. <laughs> this is good teaching. See, you've got to believe somewhere in your mind that you are gifted enough, anointed enough, positioned enough, chosen enough that you and God can take territory. Which means, so when you start your company, God is not going to let you go bankrupt. And if you went bankrupt, it's not the last good idea you're going to have. So get up and try again. Take some more territory. That job is good, but it's not the only job in the world. So if that job is not taking you where God needs to take you, you need to pray and ask God, am I supposed to shift from here? Don't just stay because you're afraid. Take territory. God gave you a book to write, a song to write, a play to write, some art to create, and you're afraid to share it with people, then that's territory you'll never take because your gift makes room for you. So every time you work your gift, every time you put your gift out in motion, someone else is seeing what God put inside of you and them agreeing with what God gave you is another mind that you now have territory with. Now, it goes beyond that. If you take territory with one person by what you created, okay, let me, let me talk about this for a minute. I wasn't going to go here. I got to go here. What's your favorite phone? Come on, come on, come on. What phones do you like? Okay. So, we got two things being yelled out. Some say Android. <laughs> Some say iPhone. So, let's talk just for a moment. Both of those are revelations of dominion. Why? Dominion means that you have operated your gift to such a degree that you now own a section of a culture. So what they understood that the church has forgotten is it's not your words that take dominion. Words change mindsets. Mindsets create movement. Movement creates the glory of God in the earth. There's got to be movement to see the glory of God come. What takes territory is a gift. Once a gift is created, if someone participates with your gift, that is the creation now of dominion because now their resources are tied to it. Their thoughts are tied to it. Their language is tied to it. Their economy is tied to it. Their future is tied to it. So now it becomes so fo focused in the mind of people. We talk about when the new Samsung is going to drop. We talk about when the new iPhone is going to drop. So they have become such a part of culture by one thing, one gift. They worked in technology, the gift. A few guys who were techies years ago began to have a dream that we are going to take over the market. And they worked their gift and their gifting until they have dominion in an area. McDonald's is a revelation of dominion. See, we talk about it's just burgers. It's not just burgers. 
Because everywhere there's a McDonald's, there's an owner. Everywhere there's an owner, there's employees. Everywhere there's employees, there's money and revenue coming in and out. Everywhere there's money and revenue, there's now talk. Because when you are up, going out, kids are hungry, they're talking about where's the Mac McDonald's. So now you now have families... You have people who build their morning around stopping through and getting their coffee. Starbucks is the same way. So everybody who's creating something is taking territory. The only people who don't think this way are church people. That's why the Bible says the children of this world are wiser than the children of light. Because they've seen the principles of God and they use our principles. They understand that a king has to have territory. His territory is, is his dominion. In his dominion, he rules by his own decisions. So when you go into McDonald's, you can't ask for Burger King. Why? Because inside of this domain, we do it this way. Ah, and what we have forgotten is we have been connected to the kingdom of God. We are a nation of kings and priests. And in seasons of open doors, God says, I'll open a door for you, but you've got to take my kingdom in with you. And we don't even recognize what kingdom we carry, what the rules of the kingdom are, how to manifest our gifting. And yet we're still struggling with believing that we are royalty. So until you are convinced you're royalty, how can you have the kingdom manifest? Woo! So we have to begin to believe what God has said about us. What good is an open door if you don't go through it? And if you go through it, go through it like a king. Because if you don't go through it like a king, you lose the ability to take over. God is not opening doors for us so we can just go in, look around, and say, isn't this a great door? Take over something. Rule something. Establish the glory of God. Become a revelation of the power of God because that's what the door is about. So this whole passage, he says, God has given us teachers for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry. What is the work of the ministry? The work of the ministry is not just us laying hands on each other and getting souls saved. The work of the ministry is what? You have been given the ministry of reconciliation. So the work of the ministry is to reconcile everything that's not connected to the Father back to the Father. So it's not just getting people saved. It's beyond that. It's reconciling marriages, reconciling families, reconciling neighborhoods, reconciling educational facilities to bring them back to the presence of God so that the rule of God, the reign of God, the glory of God can be seen in their lives. So God says everywhere you are currently working or connected, the work of the ministry has permission to be seen. So how do I reckon? You reconcile them by being an example of reconciliation. So the work of the ministry is making sure that as you're presenting the gospel, you do it in such a way that you can bring people home. That's reconciliation. Bring them home. Do people want to know God just from being around you? That's the work of reconciliation. Or after you've been around, are they so glad you're gone? <laughs> are they asking God, please get this Christian away from me? Are you so busy reminding them of their lost life that they can't find God around you? I had a lady say to me once, she said, you know, if, if I had ever met a preacher... Like you, when I was young, I'd have never left church. I said, well, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry that you went through a season where everyone decided that beating up on you was the best way to represent Jesus. Because the Jesus I know, he made everybody feel like they could come home. The depth of your sin does not outweigh the depth of his mercy. And that's what we have to remember when we're spending all of our time trying to shame people into knowing God. Don't do that. Please don't do that. He didn't do that to you. 
And it's amazing to me. I'm not going to get on another rabbit trail. I'm, I'm making myself stay on point tonight. But I'm amazed at how gracious God is to all of us. And how after a few years of knowing God, we seem to forget our own story. I've listened to some Christian parents talking to their children. I'm going, now I've known you for 20 some years. I mean, like you just got your life together. <laughs> and you're talking to your children like you was born next to Jesus in the manger. <laughs> Like Mary had twins and you, Jesus Jr. <laughs> I had to say to a friend of mine, he was uh, saying something to his son, and I can't believe you did that and you made us look bad. I said, he didn't make you look bad. He said, well, yeah, he did. I said, no, 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 no. I said, you made yourself look bad. I've known you a long time. You was looking bad long before that child got here. <laughs> Please do not put that on. That boy is new to the world. <laughs> you got stuff so far back. If we ever take out the photo album and he stopped, he said, oh, you're right. I said, then where was the mercy? How come now that you're walking with God for a few years, you're so busy to shame somebody for the stuff God forgave you for and you did it for years? And they do it a couple of times, and you go, you're making the family look bad. Mm-mm, mm-mm. Mercy. Remember mercy. Be merciful. God was merciful to you. That's how we work in dominion. That's how we work. The work of the ministry is reconciliation. Don't ever make it just the one thing of, we're just going after souls. Uh -uh, we're reconciling people back to Christ. So we're going after seeing their soul saved, but after their soul saved, can you be nice to them? Can we love them? Can we be good to each other? That's reconciliation. Reconciliation is I'm going to bring you back to the Father in such a way that you never want to leave him again. Be ye reconciled to God. Reconcile. I love the word reconcile because it's a monetary term. Reconcile. You see, before we look at it from a judicial standpoint, where we talk about the books are clean and the judge says you're free, it was always a monetary term. Reconciliation means you have to balance the books. Have you reconciled the books? What does that mean? That means at the end of the day, you have to make sure that everything is right. It's like a cashier at the end of the night. You got to make sure that everything that's missing from the store, you got money in the till. That's reconciliation. Reconciliation is the guy who's taking the tickets at the door and they give you a ticket and trade the money. When they count out, you sold 150 tickets, there needs to be money for 150 tickets. Why? If it's not right, it has to come out of the pocket of the person who sold the tickets. That's what reconciliation is. The drawer, the money in the drawer has to match up with what we say is gone from the store. So what the Lord says is true reconciliation is God said, everything you think you cost me, my blood already paid for. In the eyes of the Father, your debt is gone. That's reconciliation. So the ministry of reconciliation is telling the world, if you return to him, your debt is gone. And in my eyes, you have no debt. That's how we win the world. When you see someone at their worst, in their worst season, in their worst condition, and you say to them, I'm not racking up any points against you. You have no debt against me. Whatever your sin, whatever your brokenness, this is between you and the Father, and he loves you. Yes. It's amazing how we could love each other so much easier if we stopped racking up debt against people you know what you did to me you know what you said against me you know how you treated me i'm never gonna let that go Ooh, that's a debt you can't live with you gotta let stuff go the ministry of reconciliation 
for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Now, edification means to strengthen and grow, strengthen and grow. So when God talks about the leaders he's given to us, the teachers he's given to us, he says the first three things about them, to mature us, to bring reconciliation, and to strengthen us, edify any good leader you're under, that should be the three main things happening in your life. If those three things are not happening in your life, you need to find somewhere to be. <laughs> I'm serious. I'm amazed. Most of the trouble we have in churches is because we have people who are speaking into our lives who are not committed to those three things. If you are not being matured, if you are not being reconciled back to God, and if you are not being strengthened to walk out your destiny in God, that person is either an immature leader or they were not called. It's that simple. And we spend so much time being fed in places where we don't grow. Now, I'm fat on purpose. I like food. Now, I'm going to tell you right now. <laughs> I know that seemed like a shift, but it's in the message. <laughs> if I go to eat and the food doesn't make me not only not satisfied, but it doesn't give me any strength. You ever had a meal, you were so hungry and you go somewhere and you're eating junk food or whatever, and, and you notice like an hour later, you just don't feel great. It's too much grease or too much sugar or what? You just, you're like, man. It was good, but it didn't really help me. And then you learn, you know, when I was playing sports, so you're doing, you learn when you're young, there's, you got good carbs you can eat. You got to be ready. If you're going to play football, if you're going to wrestle, if you're going, you got to have the right food in you because you got to endure for the game. And they would make it clear to you, you cannot eat junk food before you get on the field. Why? Because you are going to run through that quickly. You had to have some pasta, some meat. Why am I saying that? The same is true in the spirit. Many times the reason we are feeling weak and we're running out of energy and we don't reach our destiny is because we've been eating spiritual junk food. It's no substance. It doesn't give you the energy to run the race. You're not able to endure. You can't go through the warfare that comes against you. You get short with people. You, you wake up the next day going, I, I felt the anointing yesterday. Why don't I feel it today? Because you can't survive in the kingdom on junk food. You have to have the bread of the word, the wine of the spirit, and the water of life. And it has to be a steady diet. That's what good leaders do. That's what good teaching does. And he says, as we grow in this, that produces what? till we all come in the unity of the faith. So unity is not possible without good leaders and good teaching. Because what bad teaching does is bad teaching divides. Wrong doctrine divides. We're supposed to be able to come together in the beauty of the word. He says, till we all come in the unity of the faith, of the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. So as we abide in good teaching, what's supposed to happen to us repeatedly is another revelation of Jesus comes. Good teaching is supposed to open your eyes to who Jesus is. When's the last time you were reading your Bible or you were listening to a good message, or, or you were at home and one of your favorite preachers or whoever it is you're listening to, and while they're talking, all of a sudden you have that aha moment, and you go, wow, I didn't know that was in the Word, or man, that's good about Jesus. That's what's supposed to happen repeatedly, that over and over the Word opens, and you see him in the book. He's revealed on the page. He suddenly speaks to you in a deeper way. You find him in the beauty of the word. You hear the voice of God speaking to you through scripture. And suddenly you begin to understand there's more of him. There's deeper of him. There's greater of him. And you begin to see him in the light of his word in such a way that it leaves an impression on you. I didn't know that was there. 
but now I'm glad I heard it. That's the life God wants you to have in the word, that continually, repeatedly, you behold him. The Bible says that there were two men who were going after Jesus had been crucified and he had been dead, and they had come to Jerusalem. And when they came to Jerusalem, they are talking about all the things they've heard about Jesus. And they're literally brokenhearted because they wanted to know if Jesus really was the Messiah, but they never met him face to face. Now, here they are, and they're going along, and they're going, oh, we never got to see him, but we heard he was Messiah. While they're having this conversation, this man joins them and says, who are you talking about? And they say, we're talking about this guy who might have been the Messiah, but we never got to meet him. And it says that the man they're talking to begins to explain from Moses all the way through the prophets, he begins to explain who Jesus is. And it says they're just going, wow, your teaching is amazing. This is incredible. And as he was about to walk away, they say, sir, don't leave us. Can you just come talk to us a little bit more? He said, sure. And it says, as they continue to talk, he goes to bless them. Just a prayer. And suddenly, he's gone. And they realize they was talking to Jesus. On the road to Emmaus. Ah. <laughs> One of the greatest stories in the Bible. They were talking to Jesus about Jesus. And Jesus didn't say, I'm Jesus. He didn't look at him and go, boo. <laughs> Y'all looking for me. He didn't open up his road and he had on a T-shirt saying, if you're looking for God, I am. I mean, you know, he could have been cool. He could have done it any number of ways. <laughs> he could have been like, you on the way to Yahweh. I'm Yahweh, you know. <laughs> Man, I got jokes all night if we start doing this. But what he did was Jesus used the scripture to reveal himself to people he's talking to face to face. His plan has always been anyone who wants to see me face to face, I do it through scripture. So if you want to see him, he'll reveal himself, but you got to meet him in the book. Ah, this is how I fell in love with the book. This is how I began to discover him. That when I began to read every Old Testament story, I began to ask the question, where are you in this? And that's when I began to discover, wait a minute. Oh, I'm trying not to go down another rabbit trail, but. Is this all right? It's like, okay, I promise we're about to get out of here. But when I began to understand that the word was to edify us, to get us stronger, to increase us, I began to listen to good Bible teachers. And all of a sudden, what I began to hear began to open up revelation in me. And I realized that even though they hadn't preached what I was hearing, it was their preaching that cracked the inside so that that water could flow out. You see, what you connect to unlocks greater in you. So if there's a healing anointing on your life, you need to be around people who move in healing. If there's a deliverance anointing, get around people who move in deliverance. If there's a teaching grace that's on you, get around good teachers. It doesn't mean that what they say needs to be how you say it. It means the oil on their life will eventually rub on you, and that impartation opens up where you can step into the same place. So I got around good teachers because I wanted to be a good teacher. I got around prophets because I wanted that prophetic flow. I got around stable ministers because I didn't want to ever be unbalanced. So I surrounded myself with people I wanted to emulate, not copy, emulate. I wanted the juice they had. I mean, that's the best way I can say it. I wanted to walk in the level of juice that was on their life. I didn't want to be a copy. Don't be a bad copy of somebody. Be you. But get around people that what's on them can get on you 
And then one day you'll find as you're walking, okay. Kenneth Hagin was one of my favorite teachers. And I would watch Kenneth Hagin, and you knew the anointing got on him because he'd begin to, he'd twiddle his fingers in a circle, his thumbs. So Kenneth Hagin would be up teaching. Now, I know I just moved. I, I hope you still got me. Okay, he got me. <laughs> Kenneth Hagin would be teaching, and all of a sudden while he was teaching, you knew he was about to prophesy because he'd lean back, and he'd, he'd put his hands like this, and he'd go, now the Spirit is saying, and anytime those thumbs twiddled, everybody in the room was like, oh, what's about to happen? <laughs> I got around good teachers. I was watching, and we would be around Oral Roberts back in the day when we were watching him pull people out of wheelchairs. And I said, Lord, you said that healing anointing is going to be on my life, so I'm going to study it. This is before we had a Benny Hinn. I'm talking about the old ones. I'm talking about T.L. Osborne and Oral Roberts. And Oral Roberts would be preaching, and he would preach a message on faith. And then all of a sudden, he was edifying the room. By the teaching of the Word and the revelation of Jesus, the room got strengthened. Everybody's faith went up to another measure. And then he would say, now, now that you believe, now that you believe the Word, do you believe? And they would go, yes. He'd say, now. Who's going to be first healed tonight? And you'd sit there and go, what? <laughs> what is he talking about? And then they would start. You remember back, they had cards. You would fill out your condition on a card. So they would have like 500 cards. And he would have a stack of cards. And he'd just start reading off conditions. And he would go, ah, oh, ah. Oh, this brother here, you've come tonight. You're in the wheelchair. You've got tumors. And cancer in your lung, bring him. He would get the worst card. And they would bring this brother up, and he's got tumors all over his body. I'll never forget watching a woman who had a tumor hanging off her side. And he said, I need one of the women to check. And they checked, and the woman was dying. I mean, it was awful. She was like 80-some pounds. She was bent over like this, big old tumor. He said, what is this here? She said, that's the tomb, Brother Roberts. He said, oh. And he took that oil, and he began to pray. And all of a sudden, as he's praying, he says, now in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, be healed. And he took his hand, and he hit the side of the tumor. And the tumor deflated in front of all of us. Everybody went, Ah, you know, that was a scream. Now, see, here's the difference. Back then, you would have newspaper reporters in the crowd. And they would come up and interview you, and they would go back and talk to your doctor because they would publish it. See, you couldn't do fake healings. <laughs> see, this stuff now people trying to do that's just getting on my nerves. You had to walk in the real power of God because they were trying to prove these guys were fakes. I've got newspaper clippings where people in the area had been healed, people we knew. They didn't just say who was healed. They gave the address of the person. <laughs> See, that's the depth of what they walked in. They gave the address of the person and said, and if you don't believe this story is true, go to their house. They live at this address, and you can interview their whole family. That's how reporters used to report a healing. I watch tumors disappear. I watch people get snacked out of, snatched out of wheelchairs. So for me, when we talk about what the church is supposed to look like, for the perfecting of the saints, maturity. For the work of the ministry, reconciliation. For the edification of the body of Christ, till we all do what? Till we all come in the unity of the faith to the revelation. So what's the revelation? That inside of each one of you, Jesus Christ wants to stand up. That's the revelation that we are supposed to be going after. That's what the kingdom is about. That's what God wants us to see. Not just that we all come to church together, that Jesus gets to stand up in each one of you. That in your life, when you leave your house in the morning, it is Jesus manifested through you that the full weight of the kingdom of God be seen. 
that every person that is bound knows they can receive freedom through you, healing through you, miracles through you, because it's not just you. The kingdom of God is in you. That's what he's talking about. And he says, because that belongs to you, he says, this is when this begins to happen, when we have that level of teaching, that level of manifestation, what happens? You will be henceforth no more children. Wow. Wow. What does that mean? That means there's supposed to come a moment where because of the level of teaching and the level of manifestation, immaturity starts to die out. Be henceforth no more children. This, this word, I love this. The word children here is napeos, napeos. Napeos literally means to speak without regard. What does that mean? To whine, whining and complaining. Do you know in the Bible, in the New Testament, to be called a child in the spirit just means you whine and complain all the time. Wow. No matter how long you've been saved, if you're always complaining, the Bible says you're a child. You are not formed. You are immature. Whew. How many of us would lose that test right there? Everybody got a little quiet for a minute. <laughs> All the amen started to die. Just there. We went from, yes, let Jesus be formed to, oh, man, I got to stop complaining. I didn't know that was on the menu. <laughs> you see, because we don't realize when he's talking about a level of authority, he says, I've given you all power and authority. But the way that the enemy knows what he's doing is working is he's listening to you. The enemy can't read your mind. So the only way he knows that it's working is when you start complaining. He didn't know he was winning until you kept saying, man, I feel like the devil is just beating me up. And he goes, oh, oh, it worked. <laughs> He didn't know you were still mad about that until you decided you needed to tell that person one more time, I'm still mad at you. You could have peace in your house, but you just won't let it go. Whew. Immaturity in the kingdom of God is revealed by your inability to walk through the storm with your mouth closed. When is the last time you had a storm? Something you didn't like, something that wasn't great. I'm not talking about people doing evil to you. I'm just talking about people might just be acting like people around you. People are going to be people. And until they get born again, you shouldn't be shocked that they're doing non-born again stuff. I had someone the other day, I, I was going into line, I was going to get something. And as I'm going in, I guess they thought that I had cut in front of them. I didn't see them. And so the guy, and this, this rarely happens to me, and the guy starts cussing like a sailor. And I'm standing there and I'm looking at him. And I had, my first response was, you know, I was, I was good at cussing. That was my first thought. I thought I used to be good at this. I used to be able to cuss so good, I'd make you regret talking to me. And right when he started, I'm looking at him. And the Lord said, this is a great moment. And I thought to the Lord, really? Really? And so I said to him, I said, bro, I said, bro, I'm, I'm not sure what's going on. I said, did I step in front of you? I said, because I didn't mean to do that. I said, but we need to take this down. <laughs> and so he keeps talking. And now my response is, so you're going to get louder. And the Lord says to me, so what are you going to do? Are you going to live this thing? Because, you know, you've met some of my family. We, we are good at we can Yes, I can. And so as I'm thinking about, Lord, if anybody got a phone in here, this won't be good. I can't say what I'm really thinking. 
Because the last thing I need is for a video to pop on YouTube and that prophet guy just cussed out this guy. <laughs> now, not, listen, I'm telling you this for a reason. Nine days out of ten, that never crossed my mind. But I had been on the phone counseling with somebody who was going through crazy. I had gotten somebody else called me, a friend of mine, who gave me bad news, and it was a perfect storm. And now after all this counsel and ministry, I step in and this from nowhere. And all of this, and it's amazing how the Holy Ghost can speak to you so quick. Because you don't think about all that till later. But I heard the Lord kept saying, this is a test. This is a test. And I finally looked at him and this is what broke it. I said, I tell you what we're going to do. <laughs> That's what I said. That's exactly how I said it. I said, I'll tell you what we're going to do. And he looked at me and said, what? I said, we're not going to act like this today, are we? And he, he kind of blinked. He said, oh. I said, because you know, I got a little bit of crazy in me, but I'm choosing to bless you. So I bless you. That's how I said it. I said it all. I bless you in Jesus' name. And he started laughing. He said, I ain't never had nobody say nothing. I said, look, cussing ain't an option for me. He said, oh. I said, now, can I bless you? And he stops, I stop, he starts laughing, I start laughing, and I'm like, Lord, you just did that because this should have went a whole nother way. Why am I saying that? Everybody's got to choose in the middle of the moment to not yield. There's never going to be a moment when your human side ain't trying to push you over the edge. And the enemy is waiting to see what you're going to do. And in those moments, you have to choose. Now, trust me, years ago, my choice wouldn't have been the same because I had not learned to let God have his way. I hadn't learned to abide in the word. I hadn't learned to get my own emotion out of the way. Now it's different. I'm saying this because every one of us is in a season where God is saying we've got to grow past the immaturity. We've got to grow past the need to let our mouth mess up our future. Because we have become too accustomed to letting the sword of our tongue just swing wild. And to step into the destiny God has for us, you've got to grow past that need. Is this helping anybody? Okay. God is always waiting to give the breakthrough. But now we've got to grow in that place and not rob God of the privilege of showing up for us. He wants to show up. You got to let him. You got to let him. Even when you feel justified, even when you know you're right, even when your first response is, nobody's ever going to do that to me again. Before you rob yourself of that victory, ask yourself, has it worked for you before? Or are you just creating another storm you're going to have to deal with later? For the edifying, for the growing up, that we be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men, cunning craftiness, but speaking the truth in love. Go down, verse 16. From whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplies. This is where we start at the beginning of the year. We talked about those two words. One is chaff, and we've been focusing on the chaff for so much of the teaching. But the second part was the Hebrew word that correlates with 2024 is the word supply. The word supply. That word supply is an amazing word, and it's so amazing. It simply means to supply, but it's hoi, hoi. Hoi, such a simple word, just hoi. It literally means the flow of life into something, to supply. The word for this year is God says, I supply. It's only showed up two times in Scripture. The two times it shows up says, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth. So as God is opening doors for you this year, as God is settling you and promoting you and leading you, the key 
is you've got to get around people that supply you. People that stir your gifts, people that cause you to want to be better, people that strengthen who you are in God. This is the year where you have to strengthen what I call your supply network, where you know you get joy from certain people. They strengthen your hope. They strengthen your peace. They strengthen you wanting to study the word. They strengthen you wanting to worship. Get around people that strengthen your walk in God. Build those supplies. Don't spend all of your time around people that want to steal your momentum in God. Who supplies your life in God? When you think about people that make you want to be better in God or better in life, are there certain people you know when you get around them, they provoke you to grow? Then strengthen those relationships. We get so busy and so focused many times on meeting the needs of those in our lives who are going through trouble, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. But many times, because we're all so focused on helping the hurting and the wounded in our lives, we don't stay connected to the strong friends because we feel like they're taken care of, they don't need anything, and so we keep focusing on the problems, and then we disconnect from the strength. And then by the time we realize we need those strong friends again, we're in the middle of another storm. But if you stay connected to some of those strong friends, just connect. It's so simple. Yeah, I'm, about, I'm almost ready to close. I just want to give you a few pieces of, of advice that will help. Number one, stay connected to people who are strong by just once a week at least. Check in with those friends who are walking strong with God. Why? Because you'll always get a good word. Sometimes all you need is a good word. Sometimes you just need somebody who doesn't want anything. And when you're on the phone with them, they provoke you. They just speak a good word. That, that's one reason why I love the leadership of this house. I love the, the friends that we all get to walk with. Because in the years that we've all walked together, the one thing I know is if I'm on the phone with Pastor Jim Bain, if I'm on the phone with Gary or Debbie, if I'm on the phone, if I'm talking to Ted Fish, if we're on the phone, we're giving each other a good word. We're strengthening each other. My, my different friends, I mean, Bishop Clinton Foster down in San Diego. Uh, oh, Lord, Apostle Will Thornton. Different ones who if I'm on the phone, I promise you, within the first five to ten minutes, we're already provoking each other. Like, well, how are you? Oh, the Lord is good. You're like, oh, yeah, he is. He is. Yeah, yeah. You cannot talk to Debbie Smith without the Lord encouraging you. You've got to have friendships, connections where you strengthen each other. So stay connected. Don't ignore the strong relationships because you're always trying to help those going through. Keep the strength in your life. Second, Build time in your family where you decompress together, de-stress together. So many times we bring all of our stress home and we let everybody pour their problems into our lives and we're trying to solve their problems. And if we're not careful, we're bringing other people's problems into the house. And so the beauty of your house is being disrupted by people who don't even live with you. So why are you letting outside noise mess up inside peace? So you've got to de-stress together. So what do you do? Very simply, for some of us who, who carry stress or you carry stuff from other people, you've got to have a cutoff time. Don't let everybody dump their stuff in your house, in your life after a certain time of night. Why? Because you know it's going to take you an hour to get that out of your head. So somewhere around 8 o'clock at night, you need to let all your friends know unless somebody is dying, don't call me with that mess. <laughs> Just come on. Defend your house. Why do you let people who do not live with you mess up the peace for the people who do? Come on. This is just simple choices. And some of you need to simply tell your friends, listen, I love y'all. But if you've been going through this all day, we'll fix it tomorrow morning. 
I'm not sitting up with you till midnight because the last eight times it didn't change nothing. <laughs> so you're not robbing my peace. You got a wife, you got a husband, you got kids, and you're going to make them sit outside while you on the phone talking to somebody who you know ain't going to listen to you. <laughs> I'm just, this is just, just wisdom, free wisdom, because <laughs> I hope it helps. Because I watch people's houses not have peace when you should have peace because most people, it's not your battle that's stealing the peace from your house. It's somebody's battle you took in. Third thing, don't ever fight with the people you live with about stuff they had no part of. What do I mean by that? Something happened on your job, something happened to your friends, and now you bring it home, and when they say, are you okay, you don't want to talk about what somebody else told you, so now you've got a fight in your house about information somebody else gave you. So I tell people all the time, if you're telling me something, unless it requires deep confidentiality, I am not going to let your mess mess up the peace with my relationships. Fourth simple thing, do not pick sides with folk not in your house. Intervene, speak life, offer advice, but stop picking sides. Because some of us have friends who are connected over here, and then the wife has a friend or your brother has a friend or your sister has a friend, and now y'all are dividing your close relationships over somebody else. Don't do that. You got to live with your people. These are the people you have covenant with. These are the people you're going to sleep in the house with. (laughs) I learned a long time ago, listen. If you want peace in your house, stop letting everybody else bring their drama to you. Fourth, this is real simple. Don't have a day where you don't pray. Abide in his presence. A lot of things become simple when you make sure every day you talk to the Lord. And for your family, remember I'm talking about right now just protecting your family. Don't have a day when you don't pray with your house. I don't care if you're mad at each other. I don't care if you're upset about something. I don't care if after the prayer, everybody gets up and goes back in different rooms. You need to build a habit of praying together because eventually when you pray together, God will show up and deal with everybody's spirit. And the stuff you would have been mad about for three months, you can get over in three days if you're willing to invite God. But if you don't invite God, you can't get mad that God didn't solve it for you. Without an invitation, I'm going to say something most of us don't think about. God does not go where he's not invited. So when people say all the time, I don't know why that happened, did anybody there invite him? You can't be mad at God for not intervening where you told him not to come. So invite him. Give him permission. Tell the Lord, Lord, I don't know how I messed my family up, but I sure want your help to fix it. And you'll be amazed at how quick he'll help you. But you can't walk around saying that y'all know y'all need to just do what I say. You ain't been right yet. (laughs) So at least ask God for help. Last thing, this is so simple. For your house, for your family, and for your life. Be quick. Be quick as you're holding strength, building strength. Be quick to forgive. Be quick to forgive. This is how we build strength with each other. This is how we walk. This is how you make sure you're not disconnected from the people you need. Because in all of our lives, the enemy will try to create a division. And sometimes the people you're going to need for your destiny are the people you're mad at right now. And because you didn't recognize that it's the enemy at work, it's not that they're trying to destroy you, it's not that they're evil, it's not that they hate you. Somewhere there was a misunderstanding. Or 
how people were raised is so different that you haven't yet come to a place of unity. And sometimes you've got to recognize they didn't do this to destroy me. They just don't know how I think yet. And if you don't use your voice, nobody knows what's in your head. So many times we're dividing from people God has put in our lives because we don't want to be heard again because we're not willing to talk. That's this whole thing. Remember, we start out so that we are no more children. Now, what do children do when they get real mad? They stop talking. So as mature people in the kingdom of God, you don't have the right to divide from people until you have a conversation. That's why the Bible says if you're upset with somebody, you're supposed to go to them. If you can't go to them, you go and get a brother. If they won't listen to the brother, you go and get an elder. Why did Jesus say those things? He was trying to put into the foundation of the church, don't act like your family. Don't divide from people just because you're mad. Don't walk away from kingdom relationships just because you misunderstood each other. He said, at least give it three solid tries of communicating with other people involved. Why? Because some of the people we walk away from are the exact ones we really needed for our destiny. But we were immature and they were immature. And we didn't know how to get to maturity together. So Jesus says, I'm putting into the foundation of the church that when you come out of your family, your history, your culture, don't do here what you were taught to do there. Don't just look at somebody and say, oh, you had to know what you were doing. How do you know they know? Have you ever had a conversation with them? Have you ever sat down with them and said to them, when you say those words, I can't trust you? Have you ever said to them, when you treated me like that, it broke my heart? Have you ever sat down and said, I know this is how your whole family deals with stuff, but my family was the exact opposite. And when you refuse to meet me halfway, you're telling me you don't respect me. Have you at least had that conversation? Because if you haven't had the conversation, then you are acting like you're not born again. Because on the inside of you, you have someone who will help you mature in that place don't throw away your strength and sometimes he says your strength from what every member supplies how much strength have we lost because we threw away some members of the body that god may have sent to be part of your life but because you couldn't get over that hump over that disagreement past that issue you just stopped talking So for each one of us, I simply say this as we get ready to close. For some of us, we got homework. I'm serious. For some of us, we got homework. For those watching and those in the room, what does that mean? Ask God, have I let go of someone that I need to reconnect to? Now, that doesn't mean giving them permission to rule and speak into your life. That doesn't mean that you're letting them back in in the full weight where they were before. What it does mean is, but be willing to have a conversation. Because sometimes time can give people perspective that you don't even know they've grown up because you just haven't been willing to have a conversation. And I know myself well enough that who I am today and who I was 20 years ago, different. I pray I'm a lot wiser now. I know I'm a lot calmer. <laughs> I'm serious. And for some of us, when you look back over your life, you have grown. You don't respond to things like you used to. You like being around people now. You used to not like people. <laughs> some of us in this room, you really didn't like people. You pretended, but you didn't like people. <laughs> but God has worked in you. Your heart is different. If you want everyone to give you the benefit of the doubt, you got to start giving other people the benefit of the doubt. And if it's hard to trust, ask God to help you. Be discerning. Be wise. Don't just throw the doors wide open to people who have abused you in the past. I'm not talking about reconnecting to abusers. Don't even hear that. I'm talking about have you given a chance to people who you just misunderstood or you made an assumption 
and never talked about it again. God is bringing us into a deeper level. And for the doors that he's opening, we've got to be mature enough to walk through these doors and operate with a greater ability to love, forgive, and discern so that we can rule in those places and not be like children and run away when the first storm comes. Has this helped anybody tonight? Okay. Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your word. I pray simply for everyone who is in this place and everyone listening. Help us go through the relationships that you've given us. And in any place where we need to reconnect, forgive, have another conversation, show that to us. Lord, we were the reason you chose to die. And you then turned around and forgave us for it. Help us be forgiving. Help us be gracious. Help us see the best in people. And help us then walk in the ministry of reconciliation so that we might bring the kingdom of God into the earth and the power of God into the world so that people will know you are real and that you're worthy to be praised. And now may the blessing of the Lord cover you and keep you. May the Lord rest upon each one of you and your families. May God answer prayers you didn't even know you needed to pray. May he show up with outrageous breakthroughs. And may in this season of new and open doors, may you step through that door and bring the dominion of the kingdom of God in every place that he's given you. In the mighty, wonderful name of Jesus, amen and amen. Oh, the Lord is good. We thank God for you. Continue to pray for us. Continue to lift us up. God is just continuing to open marvelous doors, and we thank God for it. And for every one of you, I don't know where you're going to grab something to eat, but find something good. Eat something good and think about a brother because I'm trying to get some of this gone. But so, <laughs> I love y'all.